Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Take out your Bible. I want to talk to you today about word handling, handling the word. This is Super Bowl Sunday. A lot of people are interested in handling the football. And I just might throw this around a little bit today. So, Randy, get ready. <laughs> you might have to go deep. Hallelujah. So it is Super Bowl Sunday. If you can give me my screens up there. You know, we're talking about fanning the flame. A lot of people are going to be fanning the flame for their favorite team today. But I'll tell you what, this picture of Tim Tebow kneeling on the football team, on the football field, you know, he's not in the Super Bowl this time around, but he is a, a former pro football quarterback. And... Um, he graduated from the University of Florida, one of our own, played on the Denver Bronx, New York Jets, and so forth. But he became known not only for playing football on the field, but for kneeling in prayer on the field. This posture right here went viral all over the world, what they began calling T-bowing. You know, like bowing before the Lord, but T-bowing, T-bowing, after his name. Thank God for that. And uh, I really believe that we have an opportunity in the world today to give people an answer to the questions that they have. That regardless of what you see going on in the world and the world getting darker, that there's a hunger for God. There's a vacuum that only God can fill. And that people don't know how to ask the question. But we know the answer is Jesus. We know that. God help us be more effective in how to deliver, deliver this word. Now, I don't watch a lot of football, but I, I love playing football. I played it out growing up um, as a little boy. I mean, my summers were like barefoot in shorts playing tackle football in the church field. You know, that's how I grew up. And uh, somebody asked me one time, Pastor, how do you stay so healthy? You know, and I... I had my, my blood checked to see, you know, just how strong my antibodies were. And they were like 300, like off the charts. I said, how did your antibodies get strong? I said, because when I was a kid, I ate a lot of dirt. <laughs> you know, I mean, my, my parents didn't know better. They let us go out and play in barefooted and shorts and tackle football. And we were constantly coming home bleeding. You know, we get a Band-Aid for that. You know, that's, that's how I grew up. So, yeah, that's a, that, that's a, a, a key, uh, parents. You know, let your kids eat a little dirt, right? Come on. You know, you work too hard to... <laughs> Kirsten, there's your key, your key in my sermon today, you know, for raising your children. But um, I want to show you a commercial that played around the Super Bowl some years ago now. Because if you don't like football, you might want to at least watch the commercials that play around this game because you know that advertisers are paying for these commercials six and a half million dollars for 30 seconds of time. And they'll, they'll, they'll have five or six commercials during the Super Bowl at the rate of six and a half million dollars for 30 seconds of time. Now, some of them go all out and they'll do a two-minute commercial that costs over $20 million every time they run it just for you to get your eyes on it. Now, they do a lot of research on what kind of commercials will get our attention. And guess what? That's why I want to play this commercial, this particular commercial, a two-minute commercial that they spent over $20 million every time they ran it. And how many millions to produce it? I don't know, but it values God, the Bible, hard work, family values, Honesty, kindness, all the things that, that we preach come through your walk with Christ. And I want to play it today because it also values farmers. And uh, uh, it's uh, Edgar Miller and his wife Phyllis have put together our tomorrow night's Valentine's dinner. As they do every year when they come down from Indiana, a big farm up there. And also this commercial features the voice the voiceover of Paul Harvey, my father's favorite radio you know, commentator. And uh, they used one of his uh, voiceovers you know, for this commercial. But I want you to watch this.
and on the eighth day. God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn colt and watch it die and dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. I need somebody who can shape an axe handle from a persimmon sprout, shoe a horse with a hunk of car tire, who can make harness out of hay, wire feed sacks and shoe scraps, who planting time and harvest season will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon and then paint in from tractor back, put in another 72 hours. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend to pink-combed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. It had to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners, somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and rake, and disc, and plow, and plant, and tie the fleece, and strain the milk, somebody who'd bale a family together with the soft, strong bonds of sharing, who would laugh, and then sigh, and then reply with smiling eyes when his son says that he wants to spend his life doing what dad does. So God made a farmer. To the farmer and all of us. Dodge Ram. Guts and glory. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You don't even know what uh, the commercial's for until the very end. But it gives you a picture of what advertisers determined was of value to Americans. And that's why they thought that would promote their product the best well folks we're in the right business we're in God's business to advance the kingdom of God to all the earth the Bible says until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ hallelujah that's what God has called us to and to that end I've been preaching this new year now about on this key verse here second Timothy 1 6 Apostle Paul telling young Timothy, I know that you're walking with God. You've been raised right. Your grandmother, your mother. That's why I say, I'm exhorting you, fan into flame the gift of God that w that's within you. Don't let it just be burning embers. Don't let it die out. But fan it into flame. Because our God wants fire. He doesn't like a, a cold or lukewarm. He wants you to be hot for God. My dad, he never allowed anybody to stay cool. That's cool, man. He'd say, it's not cool. You don't want to be cool. You want to be hot. You want to be hot for God. He didn't like that term, being cool, cool man. So I started out saying, we need to read the word. Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah, my word is like a fire. And Jeremiah said, earlier than that, he said, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I can't help but declare it. And that's why I'm going to go on with my message from last week where I said, read the word. Today, I want us to understand there's more to it than just reading it. Let me tell you, it's good to get it off the shelf. We don't want it just gathering dust on the shelf. So get it off the shelf and we're going to start reading the word more than we ever have before. We made that covenant. We made that commitment last week. Amen, somebody? And you can't read this word and not be changed by it. Because this word was God-breathed when it was written. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Actually, we'll go to uh, verse 1. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. It's profitable. Last week, we looked at seven ways that it's profitable. But here it is. It says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped unto all good works, all good works. So I want to talk to you uh, about doing the word today. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want to show you something that is very important for us to understand because the Bible says that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Second chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. 
in the last days perilous times shall come. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Sound like the world we're living in today? Amen. And then it says, having a form of godliness. These are probably church-going people. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's why I say in this church, we will not be politically correct and not talk about the gifts of the Spirit or miracles for today. We'll not be political correct and not allow tongue speaking to go on or prophesying to go on in this church. Listen, there's plenty of other churches that you can feel comfortable in if you just want to go to church and percolate and just sit on your blessed assurance, okay? But I'm not into that. I want to stir you up and fan into flame the gift of God that is within you. But now watch what it says here. Don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. I didn't write it, okay? A form of godliness, denying the power thereof. And listen, verse 7, look at this. These are people that are ever learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Let me tell you what that means. Because ever learning is the academic part of what we're doing here today. I'm speaking the word of God. You're processing it in your mind and in your heart, in the center of your being, the God part of you. And you're learning something today. But it says, ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. What does that mean? Well, there's two Greek words for knowledge. One is academic knowledge. And the other is participative knowledge or experiential knowledge. So this particular use of the Greek on the word knowledge is that. It's participative, experiential. In other words... These are people that are ever learning up here, but never practicing it, never experiencing it, never participating in that word. In other words, ever learning, but never doing anything with it. We don't want to be that way. So today, I got to tell you, we don't just want to be reading the word, but today we want to be doing the word. And James makes it real clear in the book of James. It says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, where you're actually deceiving yourselves. You know, you can come to church and feel pretty good at the fact that you've invested a couple hours of your time for God, you know, but that's not good enough for God. He doesn't want you just to be a hearer. He wants you to be a doer. Now, don't get afraid. I'm not sending you all into a preaching ministry or all to the mission field. That's not what we're talking about. I'm saying we want to be doers of the word in our own homes, in our marriage, with our children, with our grandchildren. We want to have the power of God, the manifest glory of God operating in our lives in whatever realm of influence that we're walking in. Amen, somebody? Wave at me all the way in the back there. Wow. Good to see that you're hearing me back there. Now, look at the screen here. Tonight, there's going to be a lot of people that are what we call armchair quarterbacks. You know, in fact, the statistics tell us that they're expecting over 112 million people to be watching this game tonight on the Super Bowl. There's over 100,000 in the stands in L.A., but over 112 million, not potential viewing audience, but that they think will be viewing. That's why advertisers are willing to spend millions of dollars on these advertisements. But these people sitting at home, I mean, they're going to be actively engaged. They think they know better than the quarterback and the coaches, and they'll be yelling, and you shouldn't have run the ball. You should have thrown the ball. What's wrong with you? Armchair quarterbacks. Oh, yeah, and they get active, get militant. I tell you what, we know better than the whole team, you know, right? But we're not going to go out there and get any bumps and bruises. (laughs) But I want to just encourage you today to get out on the field of life. I've often considered what we do here 
on Sundays or Wednesdays or anytime we meet, the holy huddle. You know, we're getting our instructions to go out on the playing field of life. Whatever realm of influence you have, because God's created you with an assignment, not just to save you and take you to heaven. If he wanted to do that, he ought to just save us and then kill us because we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to let him down. We know that, right? <laughs> so that's not his plan. He wants us to take on the assignment that we have on this earth to get saved and empowered by his assignment for each of our lives. So today, I want to talk about these word handling skills in the same way that, you know, football players have to learn how to handle this football. We can handle the word of God. We got to handle the word of God. You got to carry the word. You got to carry it. You don't want to fumble it. There's going to be times when you're passing the ball, you're handing off the ball, you're running with the ball. We're a team. We need one another. We're not alone. Randy, you better just take this pass while I go here. Here we go. Over the shoulder, over the shoulder, long. Yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Somebody out there real deep. No, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> you're out there. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> but I want you to get the, the correlation here. Handling the word. Say it with me. Handling the word. You know, the Bible talks about meditation. And this week, I'm going to bring a word to our students. I think it's going to be Friday morning if you want to come at 1030. So I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, as God would have it, uh, how to change the season of your life. How to change the season. I've, I've, God gave me this word a few years ago. And one of the elements of changing the season, according to the word of God is meditation on the word. Somebody said meditation of the word is like a cow chewing its cud. That would be, uh, it's defined in the same way. You take the word and you, you chew it, selah, you, you meditate on it. And that uh, this is important. This is a way of handling the word. But today I'm talking about doing the word. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, obedience is, is one of the things that gets God's attention in your life. Somebody asked me one time, Pastor Phil, how many chapters of the Bible do you read a day? How many should I be reading a day? And God immediately gave me an inspiration. I said, you know what? That's not the right question. How many chapters can you do a day? How many chapters are you operating in a day? I mean, if it's just one verse that you stop on and you break down and you chew up and and uh, you apply to your life. God's more interested in what you're doing with the word. So I'm going to give you just some scriptures on this. You know, God tells us he's going to give us the keys to the kingdom. The principles of how to make this book work for our lives. And I really believe that the Bible is our playbook. It's our playbook. And interestingly, it says in Ephesians 6 when it's talking about the armor of God, it says that the sword, the sword, which is one piece of the armor, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. You know, all the other armor is defensive, but the sword of the word of God is offensive. It's what you use to take the giant's head off. You know, I mean, there's sometimes I'm not just wanting to defend myself. I want to go after that enemy, take it down, put it out of its misery. Amen. Amen. And in the game of football, you can't win without a good offense. You can't win in your Christian life either just being defensive, wearing the defensive armor, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the belt of truth. You know, you need the sword of the spirit. In the football, in the game of football, you have a good defense. You're going to play a good game, but you cannot win until you score. You cannot win without an offense. The word, the word, the word. The word is your offense. There comes a point where you get tired of just fighting the battles and fighting the devil when he's coming after you. But I'll tell you what, when he sees you pick up the sword, like Jesus did in Luke 4, it is written. It is written. He didn't try to duke it out with the enemy on his own terms. He said, it is written. I want to read you some God-breathed word that you have no authority over. And Jesus won that battle. 
Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so we need to hear it or read it or see it. You know, I talk about how to fight with your faith. This is another message. But in these three points that I want to bring you, it also correlates with how to fight with your faith. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. I mean, that's one thing that you're allowed to fight with, faith. Well, how do you fight with your faith? Number one, faith sees. You have to see with the eyes of God. So when you're reading the word, you know, sometimes all of a sudden you see something clearly that you didn't see before. It's not naturalized, but it's seeing with your heart, the heart of God, seeing what the will of God is for your life. And again, please follow me here. I don't want this word ever to be so grandiose that you think it only works for preachers or it works for people with big visions. If you're raising a family, that's a big vision. If you're married, let me tell you, love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener. <laughs> if you're married, you're going you're gonna to grow in God. There's a, there's a place to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right there in a marriage. Jeanette and I have been married 46 years, right? Am I right on that, honey? Okay, because sometimes I'm adding a year because we were together two years before that, right? But I want you to see it for where you live. As soon as you see the will and the purpose of God, you have to start speaking about it. You get pregnant with that vision. Pregnant ladies, what do they talk about? They talk about what they're pregnant with. Pregnant ladies like to hang out with other pregnant ladies. What do they talk about? What you're pregnant with. You get a vision. You see something. You got to speak about it. And faith also acts. That's where it gets difficult sometimes. When Jesus told Peter, come. Step over the side of the boat. Walk on the water. Just one word. Come. Peter had to make the decision what he was going to do. But this is where we're at, church. We're at a place in the world today where... The world does not value religion. The world does not value church as we know it. In fact, a lot of people are no longer going to church these days. And we see even the next generation maybe there's, there's less of a commitment to that kind of traditional approach, you know, to your faith. But let me tell you something. Everybody is hungry for the reality of God in the world today and the reality of faith in the world today. And that's what we need to be demonstrating. So if we're going to handle the word, we got to hear it or read it, and then we have to speak it. The Bible says in Romans 10, 8, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. I like the way it, it said, not just in your mouth, because sometimes we want to think, you know, uh, just name it, claim it. We just want to speak it, you know. And, uh, but it's not that. It's coming from our mouth, but it's born in our heart. God gives a vision. And he gives us the confidence in his word. And then we declare it from a heart for God. Not just name it, claim it, frame it, all that stuff. That's not what we're talking about. But what, what it amounts to is that We've got the Holy Spirit as our quarterback. The quarterback in football calls the plays. Our quarterback is the Holy Spirit. You know, we've got this playbook, but thank God we've got this quarterback calling the, helping us call the plays as well. And um, that's why we've been saying, fan in the flame, awaken the Holy Spirit in you. If you're saved today, I don't care how active or inactive you are in the church. If you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Wake them up. <laughs> I love the story of when the disciples woke Jesus up when their boat was sinking in the storm and, and Jesus is sleeping in the boat. He's at peace. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Great peace have they that love thy law. Nothing shall by any means you know, affect them. But they're fighting for their life, you know, to save the boat. And they see Jesus sleeping. They finally wake him up. 
What, don't, don't you care that we're dying here? Well, Jesus had already spoken the word. Let's go over to the other side. We're going over to the other side. So he's always testing them and whether they were going to walk that out. But uh, they had to wake him up. Well, they woke him up in fear and unbelief, and so he had to rebuke them for that. But wouldn't it be great if they could have woken him up and say, hey, Jesus, help us speak to this wind and this rain, you know. But they weren't there yet. And Jesus got up and he spoke to the wind, spoke to the rain. And the disciples said, who is this man? Who is this man that even the wind and the rain obey him? Somebody say, wow. Wow. Hallelujah. I want you to know this God lives inside of us. We have the opportunity to speak forth by the unction of the Holy Spirit to speak the word. And then to do it, to act on it. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. Carry the ball, pass the ball, hand off the ball. Don't leave it on the shelf. I'm speaking about your Bible. Hallelujah. James goes on to say, be a doer of the work. This man that will be a doer of the work will be blessed in his deed. No, don't get comfortable in your salvation and say, well, you know, salvation is free, not by works. Lest any man should boast, you know, salvation is a free gift. That's true, but that's the only thing that's free in the kingdom of God. All the blessings, everything else comes as a result of your obedience, a result of labor and reward. God is, in, he, it's your deeds, your works are important to God. He wants to see that we're receiving his word and that we're walking in it. So I want to talk a little more about our secret weapon, the Holy Spirit that's within us. I want to give you some scripture. They're always some of my favorite. Colossians 1.26 talks about the mystery, the mystery of this faith that we walk in. You know what it is? Christ in me, the hope of glory. We talk a lot about the glory of the Lord, and it sounds so abstract. We try to define it. It's the manifest presence of God. What does that mean? Well, the presence of God is not a wisp of smoke, you know, a cloud that's going to come and do nothing. The manifest presence of God, there's nine manifestation, manifestation gifts that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Gifts of healing, miracles, discerning of spirits. You know, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Christ in you wants to manifest out of you. And inquiring minds in the world want to know, is there a God that's real on the earth today? Wake them up. Wake them up. Let them manifest out of your life. That's the protocol that God has put on the earth today. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, we have this treasure, the Christ in us, in earthen vessels. So that the excellency of the power of God would be not of us, but of God, not of us. So you can say, well, pastor, you know, I I don't feel up to it. You know, I feel weak. Yeah, so do I. But we have this treasure, this power, this glory, this manifest glory of God in this frail earthen vessel. So that no one's going to get the glory except God, the power of God working through us. Amen, somebody. So it's a treasure within Ephesians 3.20, one of my favorite verses. It says, God is able. God is able. You know, God is able, so we are able because he's in us. God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen and amen. God said it. That settles it, whether you believe it or not. God said it, and that settles it. But we're going to learn it. We're going to understand it. We're going to walk in it. We're going to act on it. And the church of Jesus Christ, the remnant church, is going to rise up in the midst of a dark world and be the light of the world and be the answer vessel for God to work through. Amen, somebody? (laughs) Romans 8, 37 It says, we're more than conquerors. What does that mean? In all these things, we're more than conquerors. And that means because we have an eternal value to look forward to. My dad is more than a conqueror. 
You know, and I can't forget him more recently preaching, you know, when people are talking to him about his mortality, his age and all that. He says, listen, I died 70 years ago. When I got born again, I died. And I was born again. And now I'm living in eternity. And um, he, had, he definitely lived with eternity on his mind. He preached a lot about the glory of God. I'm going to give you just a few verses on that, and then I'm going to close. Habakkuk 2.14 says, and I'm just declaring this. I want you to embrace this with me. This is a prophetic word. A couple places in Scripture, it says, The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, some people are prophesying that there's going to be a great falling away. Well, I believe we're already in the midst of that. We're in the midst of that. If you, you don't have to look around very much to see there is a great falling away. But I'm looking for a great harvest as the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord like the waters cover the sea. The manifest presence of God, the glory of the Lord. And then in Revelation 11:15, you often hear me quoting these two verses together. It says that until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. What does that mean? That we're going to keep possessing this land until we possess these earthly kingdoms that are anti-God. We're going to turn them around. We're either going to break them down and conquer them or we're going to win them over. That's it. Maybe we'll win them over with our good deeds. I don't know, but we're either going to win over this political system or we're going to replace it. <laughs> we're either going to put some of our spirit-filled young people into those places of office, you know, or, you know, we're going to win them over. I'm still praying for our president, our cabinet, our house, our, you know, both sides of the aisle. Because with God, all things are possible. I'm not against anybody. In fact, I, anymore, I, I'm thinking more like I'm independent. You know, um, I know some good Democrats. Really? I know some good Republicans. <laughs> and I'm right there in the middle there. I'm independent. I'm for God. You know, I'm for the kingdom of God, the word of God. I'm voting for whatever platform lines up best with God's platform. I'm voting for imperfect people as long as their platform is more like God's word. They can win me over. Just tell me that you're going to govern according to some of the laws of God. In fact, I'd like it to be all the laws of God. And I'm going to vote for whoever lines up more with the platform of God in my life, whether I like them or not, because I'm going to tell you, we're always voting for imperfect vessels. Amen. You even have preachers like me that are imperfect vessels. But you got to just trust the word that's coming out of them. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I want to close uh, with a, a portion of scripture. I'm just going to put before you again. We're going to read it together because you hear me quote this a lot. And I just want you to know that uh, this verse is about us. It's a prophetic verse. And I believe for the day we're living in because it says that God's glory will arise upon us. And the verse I didn't put up there, the very next one, uh, it, it says, you know, it's going to be seen, but kings and nations will be drawn to the brightness of our rise. And let's read it together. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And then it says, and kings, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Folks, on this Super Bowl Sunday, whether you're watching the game or not, can I ask you to get a vision for handling the word of God like a, a professional or well-seasoned football player handles a football. Because God's given us this word, not just to read it, not just to understand it academically, but to operate in it. That means handling the word. And we're doing it together. You know, we're passing off the football, you know, to one another. Nice. There you go, Jesse. 
You might think I'm a player, right? <laughs> she, oh, she can't believe it. But think about this. If that many people are getting excited about a little pigskin football, you and I are reading a word that was written by 66 authors over more than 2,000 years, prophetic words that were made 200 years to over 2,000 years in advance that are coming to pass. This book is God-breathed, and God has an assignment upon our lives to be a testimony, to be a witness, to be a living example of the reality of God on the earth today. I want to be faithful to that assignment, and I think we've got an awesome team here in this church. We're a community of people, not just a Sunday go to meeting church. I believe that God's got a future for us that the best is yet to come. I've not seen anything yet. And uh, I'm excited about that. But I want each and every one of you to understand God knows who you are. He birthed you, conceived you in your mother's womb. He's got an assignment upon your life. Don't ever minimize that. Don't think it's small. Don't think you're insignificant. But let God use you. Let's all stand together, and we're going to close. I, uh, I'm going to, in a moment, call up those of you that we baptized recently. We want to hand you a certificate and just want to lay hands on you in the front here. But before we do that, I'm going to ask God to lay hands on every one of you. I wish we had time to just make an altar call, and I am going to have the altar teams up here. If you feel led at the close of the service just to have somebody lay hands on you i've laid hands on these team members to be the hands extended of our elders and pastors here in this church i believe you can get a miracle through the laying on of hands but there's so many here i'm going to just ask god to lay his hands on you right where you stand here in the house there's many thousands online God can touch you right where you're at there. Our online church, we love you. You're part of this. I just want you to raise your hands right now. I'm going to ask God to put his hands in your hands. Father, right now, we are carriers of your word. Lord, we love your word. Father, we've purposed in our heart to read it, to understand it. Father, I'm asking you to help us know how to handle it, to carry it, to hand it off, to carry it across a goal line. Maybe on behalf of children or grandchildren in our realm of influence. Maybe in our home or in our place of business or at school or in the marketplace, wherever it is, Father. Anoint these hands to lay hands on the sick. Anoint our hearts to believe, to receive and believe. Anoint our lips to speak, to speak encouraging words to others. Lord, I pray, let this word be given opportunity to be applied in each of our lives, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now put your hand on your heart. If there's anybody here that you're not sure you're right with God, I want to just lead us all in a prayer that can be salvation for you or it can be a rededication for maybe most of us here today. But let's just pray this today. I can't imagine that anybody would not want to be receiving the gift of salvation, freely given by the work of Christ. You don't qualify for it. Nobody has. But Jesus paid the price for your salvation. So receive it to get today by believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth. We're going to do that together right now. Let's pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe and I receive your gift of salvation into my life. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Empower me with your spirit. I want to walk with you. I want to be stronger with you. I want a closer relationship with you. Today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says as many as receive him, he gives you the ability to become sons and daughters of the living God. So let's just say thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We have a heavenly Father that loves us. Hallelujah. I wish you'd all help me now for those of you that...